Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scher. Today, my guest is Professor Lucia Aronica. She is a PhD and professor at Stanford University, but she's taken sort of a circuitous, circuitous path to get there. She's originally from Italy, and you'll hear in her lovely accent that she is, is pure Italian. Um, and then she got her PhD in molecular biology in Austria. She trained at Oxford and then found her way to Stanford specifically to do genetic and epigenetic analysis of the diet fit study. So in this in this interview, we get into the science. She loves science. You're going to see her passion for the science and the epigenetics. And we talk a lot about what epigenetics are and the research behind them. But we also talk about some very simple concepts like gender stereotypes and how that impacts um, the diet fits results and how you structure diets and how that even, or sorry, how you structure studies and how that even is going to impact um, the results. I think you'll enjoy her passion. If you get a little lost in the science, stick with it because um, she has some great gems at the end uh, where her personality shines and about how we just should be acting as human beings and as scientists, um, acting as kids for the, for the love of knowledge and um, not so much about the wars and the battles, which I think is great for all of us. So enjoy this episode with Professor Lucia Aronica. Lucia Aronica, welcome to the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Brett. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So as a Stanford alumni, I always love having Stanford faculty on. It doesn't happen often, but when I get the chance to do it, I welcome it. I just wish you would have been there 20 years ago when I was at college. I would have loved to have taken your course, which I want to get to. But first, give us a little bit of your background, how someone came from presumably a pasta eating family in Italy to get a PhD, to end up at Stanford, and now to be studying low carb. Give us a little bit of your of your journey. Yes, I I use actually to describe my professional journey as a, a love story between food and science. My first love was food. I was born in Italy where uh, we value food as a key component of health and happiness. And then my second love was science. I um, moved from Italy first uh, to the University of Vienna and then uh, to the University of Oxford to study epigenetics. And epigenetics changed the world I looked at food. I um, started to realize that actually uh, food is not only calories, but biological information. It's one of the most potent signals to our genes. And then finally, I was able to combine my love for food as medicine and uh, science, epigenetics, uh, by joining um, the group of Professor Christopher Gardner at Stanford University and study how a low carbohydrate diet and a low fat diet can change our epigenetics and affect our health. Now, did you also have a personal experience with a low-carb or keto diet that sort of also helped your enthusiasm for the subject? Yes, yes, I did. I did. During my PhD, I was not only experimenting in the lab, but also experimenting in the kitchen. Actually, at that time, I uh, was uh, uh, I did the, um, uh, a bodybuilding program. I, I was actually very strong. I'm still strong and lift weights and love my squats and deadlifts. But at that time, I, 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 I was really serious with my workouts. And uh, I experimented with the ketogenic diet, as many uh, athletes do. Uh, actually, the ketogenic diet was very popular in the 80s in the, in the um, uh, bodybuilding community. Um, and uh, by doing that, I um, realized something that was very counterintuitive for me. So by eating uh, less carbohydrates, my triglycerides, which are uh, lipids, so I was eating more fat, but my fat, the fat in the blood, my triglycerides, went down three times. So I, I started with a healthy value of uh, um, 80, 90 um, uh, milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides, ended up with 30 milligrams uh, per deciliter of triglycerides, which I maintain now. And my HDL 
skyrocketed from a healthy value of 60 mg per deciliter to a value of 135 mg per deciliter, which I maintain today. And that also, um, uh, I, I also learned something about what is normal, considered normal. Like, you know, I was in the normal range and I felt very, very healthy. Uh, and then um, uh, the, suddenly I found myself having abnormally healthy values. Every time I, I, I went to the doctor, my doctor used to ask me, what do you do for your health? What, what the, <laughs> and so I, I was motivated by, uh, by that. And also my mother, uh, um, my mother had a, a brain stroke uh, in uh, 2014, she uh, also had very high triglycerides and uh, um, uh, and high HDL, and uh, the doctor recommended uh, her to go uh, on a low fat diet um, uh, and to take in, uh, to take cholesterol lowering drugs. Um, inspired my, by my transformation story, I advised my mother to try instead a low carb, high fat diet. And after two months, her triglycerides went down. She went to the doctor and the doctor asked her, what did you do? And she told the, the doctor, I did the opposite of what you <laughs> told me to do. <laughs> I went high fat and no, med no, no medicine. So yeah. of course, uh, this, uh, this uh, story also motivated me um, to... Uh, join uh, um, the group of Professor Christopher Gunner, who um, uh, was just launching uh, in 2014 the largest study ever undertaken to compare low carbohydrates and low fat diets um, uh, uh, for, for weight loss. Yeah, so I definitely want to get into that study. But first, a couple of things about what you said. I mean, as a cardiologist, I've never seen anything reduce triglycerides and raise HDL as well as low carb diets. And it was frustrating to me that I wasn't taught that. That's just something we're not taught. And that's what I love about your story. Sort of you approach it from a scientific standpoint and from a personal standpoint. And I see that so often when people actually study and learn the science and become aware of the science that's out there. And then they realize, huh, there's something to this and get the personal experience. That's what makes uh, such like a, a heartfelt success. That what make what makes people really passionate about promoting low carb diets. At least it does for me and it does for a lot of other people because it's not talked about enough. And I, I really appreciate that approach. But you you mentioned a couple a couple words, big words. I want to go back and, and review um, about your in your progress. You talked about epigenetics, you talked about food as a biological substance, as medicine, as affecting our genes. So give us sort of the the overview of those topics and how you see their importance to health. Yes. Um, the prefix epi means on the top. So epigenetics, um, uh, epigenetic marks are uh, molecular switches on the top of our DNA that can turn genes on and off, just like a dimmer switch modulates lights up and down in the room. And this can explain why DNA isn't destiny. Why, for example, you have the same DNA molecule in every single cell of your body, and yet your skin cells look different from your brain cells. So just think at, of your DNA as hardware, then the epigenome, the epigenetics, is the software that is different in every uh, single cell of your body and turns on and off different genes in different cells so that they look and perform differently. And uh, even animals and people that have the same genetics, but different epigenetics, can look very different from each other. Think of identical twins, but also the caterpillar and the butterfly, queen bees and worker bees, They've all the same DNA, but they look very can look very different from each other. Even identical twins can develop different um, predisposition to diseases as they uh, get older. And uh, I think one exciting property of epigenetics is that some epigenetic marks are 
permanent, as if written with a pen, but some others are written, are written with a pencil, so they are potentially reversible. It's good news that some epigenetic marks are written with a pen, so that, for example, your skin cells don't suddenly turn into brain cells. But it's also good news that some uh, um, epigenetic marks are written with a pencil because it means that lifestyle can change your epigenetics. It means that lifestyle is biological information. So food is not only calories, but the inf biological information exercise also is not only about burning calories, but it's biological information. Emotions are biological informations, uh, information. And uh, our health is actually a book in progress that we write every day using our genes as the paper, our lifestyle as information, and epigenetics as either the pen or the pencil. The great description. And, and I think that's so important because so many people think their genetics is their destiny. And it's clear that that's not the case, that we can change. And the way you said it, food can change our gene expression. Exercise can change our gene expression. And even how we feel in our emotions can change our gene expression. Now, that's something we didn't know, what, even maybe 10 years ago? Like, how new of a, of a study is this? Yeah, no, it's uh, we we uh, the field of epigenetics um, is has been booming in the last slowly in the last twenty years and then probably uh, in the um, in the past ten years has, 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 been, has been really booming, and uh, um, I uh, I was actually uh, very lucky uh, to start my PhD. Um, when uh, um, the, the, Do the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, for RNA interference, which is uh, just a kind uh, of epigenetic information, was uh, awarded uh, in two thousand and six. So I felt thrilled of uh, of um, starting to um, about starting to work in this field. Yeah, right place at the right time to to kick off this great career. Now, so that. That interest is what brought you to Stanford to work on the diet fit study. And um, if I, I'll give a quick summary, and then you can sort of take it from there, I guess. But it was it was a follow up to the A to Z trial. Um, the A to Z trial showed that the people who are on the Atkins lost more weight than Ornish and Zone and other trials. And then the diet fits, as you mentioned, was the largest study to compare low carb versus low fat in a randomized trial. And at the end, it was considered a negative study, that there was no difference. But I think the details kind of speak a little bit differently. So tell us a little bit about your perspective of the Diet Fits trial, what it shows and what it doesn't show, and kind of what you're looking at as the next step. In the primary analysis of the study, which was published in 2018, we didn't find any significant difference in weight loss between the low-carb and the low-fat group. But uh, to interpret uh, these results, we need to consider an important um, aspect of the study design that uh, led uh, to some overlap in macronutrients uh, distribution between the low carb and the low fat diet. Um, and this is for two reasons. First, um, both diets were focused on quality, so whole food, and they both minimized refined grains and carbohydrates um, and, and sugar. So they were both lower in carbohydrates compared to a standard American diet. Second, um, uh, the participants were instructed to strictly, strictly limit uh, their carbohydrate or fat intake only uh, during the first three months of the study. And then they were allowed to slowly titrate back carbohydrates and fats up to a level that they thought was sustainable for life. The goal here was uh, um, to um, make the results actionable for most people and relevant for public health. And 
in any uh, dietary intervention, there is a, a trade-off, some trade-off between science and public health. A more science-focused design, such as, for example, a metabolic world study, is better at addressing the question of whether a diet is effective, whereas a more public health-focused design is more effective at addressing the question of whether a, di a diet is sustainable. But I think it's, it's important to stress that these are two very different questions and that uh, the question of whether a diet is sustainable or not and what constitutes, what co what co constitutes a, a sustainable diet is, is a very tricky one. For example, uh, for you guys in Sweden, uh, it might be easier to embrace a low carbohydrate diet than for us in Italy, because we love our pizza, spaghetti, and tortellini. But this doesn't mean that Italian people cannot enjoy a low carbohydrate diet. After all, my family and I have been enjoying a, a low carb diet now for more than 10 years. And, uh, and here I, I have perhaps um, a piece of advice to share um, with the, anybody, anyone who wants to um, reduce their uh, refined carbohydrate intake, whether it's about spaghetti, um, macaroni and cheese, bread. Um, so it's uh, becoming smart hedonistas, hedonists. So my, my Italian friends always tell me, Lucia, I prefer to keep eating my spaghetti and have a shorter but happier life. And I always tell them, I also love pleasures. I just use my pleasures and don't let them use me. I'm a smart hedonist. I think that any, we uh, humans um, love uh, adding uh, the same routine, wearing the same um, clothes and adding similar foods every day. And we can use this nature to select and stick to do those habits that make us uh, happier and healthier in the long run. After all, we, I think we can all agree that feeling great and having the energy to work, exercise, and take care of our family are life's greatest pleasures. Great point. I mean, that's what's priceless. And that's why there's not one diet for everybody. And yes. When, no, when we promote low carb diets, we promote it as an option for people that we, I think we need to talk about more as a potential option, but not as the one diet for everybody. And that's part of what bothers me about, you know, some pushing vegan diet as the one diet for the whole world, like with the Eat Lancet report. And that's just, that's just bound to fail because there, there isn't one diet for everybody. Um, no, to, to rewind for a second though, and to, to talk about the setup for the diet fit study, you said it in a very um, polite and, and balanced way. But the way I would say it was, this makes me mad. I mean, this really upsets me the way that they started at 30 grams per day, ended at 130 grams, and the low fat group was at 210 grams of carbohydrate. So it was 130 versus 210, and they still report it as low fat versus low carb. Because then the then it becomes a misnomer. It's no longer a low carb study. So that's part of what really bothers me about this trial. And I get it. It's they designed it to be sort of a real world sustainability trial. But if you design it in a way that you when you interact with people and you say, look, this is a pretty hard diet to stick with. So I want you to start with 30 carbs, do it just for three months, and then you don't have to do it anymore because I know it's hard to do. Versus, look restricting carbs may seem hard at first, but look at all these examples of these hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people have done it for years. It's something people can stick to if you really stick with it. And the reason why I make a big point about that is because it's the same with a physician. It's the same with a nutritionist. If, if you sit down with them and they say, wow, this is really hard to stick with. I don't think you're going to be able to do it. That's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the same for, um, the same for the study 
So I don't, I'm, I'm sort of just venting here and I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir with you, but I, I think that's a problem with the, with the study design, but you're not accepting just on face value that it wasn't, um, a, that it was a negative trial with no difference in terms of weight loss or in terms of benefit for insulin resistance or genetics, because it sounds like you're taking it to the next step to analyze things even further. So what is on the horizon for you with, with how you're analyzing the data further to find more nuance and detail? I'm working on uh, three um, personalized nutrition projects uh, within the uh, Stanford Diet Kits um, to look at whether biological differences between people, uh, epigenetics, genetics, and sex differences can affect the response to a low carbohydrate uh, or a low fat diet. Uh, for uh, the epigenetic project, I'm uh, uh, focusing on uh, an epigenetic biomarker of type 2 diabetes and asking, is this biomarker written with a pencil? Can we reverse it with a weight loss diet? Is there a difference between the low carb and low fat diet? We have a, a hint that this might be the case because these epigenetic biomarkers, biomarker has been shown to uh, go up. So the risk of the type 2 diabetes goes up when uh, triglycerides go up and HDL goes down. And we see that these... Uh, uh, two uh, blood lipids are beneficially, more beneficially affected um, by a low carb than a low fat diet. Uh, I'm also going to work on another epigenetic project um, and look at whether after weight loss, um, people become epigenetically younger. Epigenetics uh, provide a way of uh, uh, measuring uh, our age uh, biologically. This is called biological age. It is the age of our cells and tissue, as a, um, and it can be very different from our chronological age, which uh, we typically measure by counting our birthdays. Um, I'm going to uh, work um, on this project um, with uh, um, uh, Professor Karl Heinz Wagner at the University of Vienna and Professor Steve Horvath, who recently gave a TED talk on the topic of uh, biological age uh, and also um, uh, a lecture um, for my online course uh, on diet engine expression. You can find this lecture on uh, my YouTube channel. I think it's a, it's a very, exci uh, very exciting and informative lecture. Um, the second project, is uh, uh, the project with the genetics. And I'm starting this uh, project with uh, Professor uh, Jose Ordovas at Tufts University. We are going to expand on uh, um, uh, our primary analysis in which we looked at only three genes and we couldn't find any uh, effect of genetics on, on the response to a low carb or a low fat diet. Yeah, I want to interrupt for a second right there because I think that's such an important point. That there were three genes that were being that were tested in the original diet fit study. So to say that that the nutrition, whether low carb or not, had what, no relationship to g genetics. Like that's just a broad statement. No relationship to genetics, as opposed to saying no relationship to the three genes that exactly. we studied. <laughs> Two totally different statements, right? But I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get, I get mad every time I I, I read the health news. I, I I I'm trying to teach my students also how to read the the health news. That's important. That's probably the most important lesson you can teach them. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. so how many genes are you going to study then in this in this secondary trial, the, the secondary analysis? We don't know yet, uh, hundreds or potentially thousands. So this is a new approach. Uh, uh, it's called genome-wide polygenic scores, GPS scores. Um, so we um, we are are going are going to see which um, yes uh, include as, as many genes as possible to increase the uh, predictive power of uh, of uh, um, our predictions. And so there's a lesson here for uh, those that um, are using or want to use uh, um, personalized health reports that are now widely available on the internet. 
uh, most of those reports are based only on a few genes, which uh, makes them highly inaccurate. For example, uh, according to 23andMe, I am 75% likely to have straight hair. And now I have two sisters that are, that are cardier than me, and so this illustrates the point very well. Uh, but things can even uh, um, uh, um, less predictive when it comes uh, to um, uh, genes that predict the response to diet. Uh, for example, most uh, of, the, of the genetic variants uh, that are claimed to be a contraindication for a high fat or a, a ketogenic diet uh, were identified only in observational studies with no replication in intervention studies and in the context of diets that were high in both fats and carbohydrates. These diets are called obesogenic high fat diets and there's a reason for that because they are bad for our health independently of uh, which genes we have um, this doesn't mean uh, that i think um, uh, the field of personalized uh, nutrition based on genetics uh, it's soul smoke and mirrors uh, we do have uh, uh, already some examples of well-researched genetic variants that uh, can uh, uh, really affect um, how people uh, respond to diet. For example, whether people are lactose intolerant or not, whether they can use uh, effectively um, omega trees from uh, uh, plants uh, such as uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, most, uh, most Caucasian can't, and this is relevant, for example, for uh, vegan people. On the other side, um, some other people uh, are at higher risk of low-grade inflammation when um, they um, uh, eat uh, vegetable oils or an excess of vegetable oils rich in omega-6s, and this is the case of almost all African people and might explain why uh, African people are at higher risk of cardiovascular uh, disease when they eat uh, a Western diet, which is typically uh, higher in uh, vegetable oils and uh, omega 6s. Yeah, there is so much, so much in that what you just said that. Um, for the majority of these genetic profiles that people get focus far too much on one gene rather than looking at the whole picture. And the context is so important. And I love, I have to repeat what you said that most of those studies were observational studies on high carb, high fat diet. So how do we know at all if that applies to a healthier, low carb, high fat diet? And, and we don't just because it hasn't been studied, but it doesn't mean you have, you can throw out the whole genetic profile because there are some genes that make a difference. And especially when it comes to omega-6, the, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, there's so much debate. There's so much mechanistic evidence that they're inflammatory and oxidizing and, and dangerous and we should avoid them. And then you go to the clinical trials and the human data and it doesn't translate. We don't see necessarily um, this overwhelming danger of, of eating omega-6 fats in the clinical trials. So there's, there's a disconnect and part of it could be genetic variation, which definitely could be the case. And part of it could just be where's the food coming from and the volume and so forth. But, but that's where genes can play a role. So it's good to see or good to hear someone like you who, who knows this inside and out, knows the details that these are the genes, there are genes in these areas that we can and should pay attention to that may um, inform us clinically. Because that's what people want to know. What, if I get this genetic profile, what can I change to help me? And that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, it is. I, I used to um, say to my students, uh, uh, always assess context, avoid confusion, achieve control. <laughs> when you read uh, context, context, and then, and, and then the question, you know, what was tested in which context and um, for which people is so important. Right. And then the the third part of the study that you're working on that we haven't gotten to yet, which I think is one of the most interesting that you presented on at Low Carb Denver, 
and we have that we have that talk on our website at dietdoctor.com for our members to see. They can see your whole talk there. But you looked at the gender specificities of how people responded to the low carb diet, how they complied with it, and the response they got. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I thought that was fascinating. Yes, uh, that study is currently under under review. So stay tuned. It will be hopefully published soon. Um, we compared weight loss in men and women and found something surprising. So first, um, the men uh, lost significantly more weight on a, a low carbohydrate diet than on low fat, uh, whereas the women lost similar amounts of weight on low carb and low fat. And second, the women had the lowest adherence to the diet of all groups, uh, which begs the question of whether they might, like the men, have lost more weight on the low carb than on the low fat diet, had they only behaved well on, on low carb. Now, we, we don't know, we cannot answer this question, but we have a possible explanation as to why the women didn't behave well on low carb. Several studies indicate that women avoid fats more than men. And also the women in our study reported to avoid fats more than men in our food questionnaires, which might have made for them more difficult to stick to a low carbohydrate diet, which is also high in fat. And, and everyone can test this hypothesis. Um, next time you go to the, to the supermarket, just look around. It's no coincidence that every low fat yogurt is pink, but rather a very smart strategy of the low fat industry. So it really speaks to gender stereotypes. It's not just what, what toys kids play with, but it's what, um, how we get marketed to and what we eat as adults. And it's maybe stereotypically a little harder for the woman to sit down and order the big ribeye with butter on it, whereas the, the man wouldn't think twice about doing that. So stereotypes really do play a role in how people are portrayed on TV and movies. And it's always, I'll take the salad with the dressing on the side. And it's um, it, it really does affect society. It affects how people think. And, and I think that was reflected in that analysis, which is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think becoming aware of this stereotype can help um, uh, people escape their pitfalls and take control of health, uh, women, um, especially women. Now, you've also s said before that you teach a couple classes at Stanford, and one of which that I thought was so interesting was one of the ketogenic diet and the fasting mimicking diet. And um, it, it's a very interesting combination to teach both of them. And first, that's awesome that there's a class about that. I think that's amazing and, and shows how far we've come um, in the science of nutrition. Uh, but tell us a little bit about this class, what you, what you like about it, what are some of the things you teach and some of the main premises? Yes, uh, first of all, fast mimicking diets are diets that reproduce, mimic the uh, biological effects of, uh, of fasting and its benefits. And um, I teach that um, the hallmark of all fast mimicking diets is uh, ketosis, so the production of uh, ketone bodies. And therefore, there are many ways of doing a fast mimicking diet because there are many ways of uh, producing ketones. Uh, uh, nutrition is, uh, is a, a toolbox and there's almost never only one way of uh, doing a diet. And so um, you can do a fast mimicking diet by restricting what to eat, for example, carbohydrates in case of a ketogenic diet, when to eat, uh, for example, with time restriction feeding, also known as TRF, where you limit your eating window to eight hours or 10 hours in, in, in the day, uh, or how much you eat. Um, uh, there are some protocols, for example, the uh, um, uh, prolonged diet uh, uh, by Professor Bartlett Longo, 
which is based on a strict calorie restriction, up to 500 calories for uh, five days. Um, all, all these modalities um, induce the produ production of uh, ketone bodies, uh, but also exercise induces the production of ketone bodies. Athletes, for example, go into ketosis after um, a workout and uh, exercise has some fast mimicking benefits, including uh, autophagy. So all these modalities can actually uh, synergize together. Now, um, of course, uh, uh, the, the degree of ketosis and the modalities of, of ketosis, whether it's a continuous nutritional ketosis or intermittent ketosis, will differ on these diets. And also, ketosis is not the only hallmark, hallmark of uh, uh, fast-making diets. Uh, there is uh, also epigenetics, gene expression. Um, for example, we see that uh, Fasting and uh, and a ketogenic diet have very induce very similar changes in uh, gene expression in children uh, that uh, are affected uh, by epilepsy. Uh, there is uh, autophagy, which is a, a mechanism of uh, removal of cell trash that make us our cell that make our cell stronger and uh, um, and younger. Uh, and then there is uh, uh, IGF-1, stem cells, and all these uh, effects also differ between people. For example, um, uh, uh, you hear, we hear very often that um, fasting up, uh, produces a beneficial spike in uh, growth hormone in the first, first two days, which, which preserve muscles and lean tissue. Uh, but this was shown only in young lean people. And uh, it seems not to be true for uh, obese and older people. And so at least in the study that were published. So it's, um, mm, uh, therefore, I like, for example, that this might uh, explain uh, uh, why the athletes that are, are uh, trying more and more TRF in combination with a, a fasted uh, workout, and uh, uh, they, they are seeing great results. This doesn't mean that, um, uh, I'm just pointing out again, context is important. Uh, I think, you know, for obese people, fasting can be very beneficial. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps you know they, they don't need to count on the on the, they need, they don't care whether they also lose a, a, a little lean tissue in the process because they, they want to lose weight and uh, and they can go uh, go for a longer fasting which usually uh, is more associated with metabolic benefits and longevity whereas the short fast like TRF is more for body composition. So maximizing and usually is coupled with exercise and, uh, uh, and uh, it is a way of uh, uh, basically uh, creating, creating a, um, um, a storm in your, uh, in your body in which you, um, you start to um, uh, really activate lipogenesis uh, with the, and then with the fasted uh, workout, uh, these, uh, these effects are even greater. And then after the workout, you have uh, the biggest meal of your day. You have super compensation uh, and then activation again of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know, like, uh, cellular processes that, that yeah. build muscle so that you have benefits in, a, in, a, in, a, in a body composition. So with yeah, that's a great loss, point. I, I, max, I can maximum go... fat loss before and then maximum uh, uh, muscle, uh, building muscle after the workout. Yeah. So going back to context too, like if, if you're worried about losing muscle mass with fasting, any studies that have shown a correlation there what were they doing for exercise? Were they doing any element of resistance training? Because it probably doesn't take 
much resistance training to counteract that loss or even maybe gain some lean muscle mass even while fasting, especially for the shorter fast. So I think, again, like you said, context is important. Now, one interesting thing about fasting versus ketogenic diets and how they relate, when it comes to um, insulin, both are going to lower insulin and mimic fasting. But when it comes to other elements like mTOR or um, AMP kinase, for those, I wonder if the ketogenic diet isn't going to impact those as much as fasting will, and does that matter? What is your take on that? We don't know. Actually, yeah. there are not so many studies uh, in, uh, in humans. There are lots of studies in mice. From the study mice, actually, we know that um, uh, uh, keto, uh, ketogenic diet does induce uh, uh, autophagy and does induce cell, stem cell renewal, especially in the gut. Uh, gut cells um, uh, uh, have a higher production uh, of ketones, uh, always, um, and uh, uh, so higher than the other cells. And uh, apparently, this uh, is, uh, is necessary to maintain their stemness, their state of, of stem cells. So at recent, this was a recent paper, I think published on Cell in 2019, showing that in mice, ketones are metabolized that instruct cell fate. So maintain stemness in the gut. So- That's really important because stem cell regeneration is, is like the fountain of youth. That's how we keep ourselves young. That's how we keep regenerating tissue. And that's one of the main proponent or one of the main um, votes in favor of a fasting mimicking diet because they showed their formulation in rats uh, helped with stem cell regeneration. So if the same, or maybe mice, rats or mice, I forget, but if the same can be shown for a ketogenic diet, that's really interesting. I wasn't aware of that. So are you saying those are pretty equivalent then as far as the literature is this, concerned? This study were done in mice. So again, yeah. I just, I'm interested in the science. I think that there right. are some potential mechanisms. Uh, there is a lot of overlap uh, from the epigenetic point of view. We see an overlap with the genetic and fasting uh, from uh, the autophagy uh, uh, also, uh, there are studies showing in mice that keep, uh, fasting and the ketogenic diet both trigger autophagy. Uh, autophagy. Study mice also show that fasting and the ketogenic diet both uh, induce stem cell renewal. So from a, a biological point of view, there are lots of overlap. I would love to see more studies in humans really comparing all these modalities. There are no study of this kind so far. We, we uh, you know, the, 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 the largest study in human were only done, for example, with a, with a fast mimicking diet by Professor Walter Longo, but there was no comparison with another diet. Um, people um, improved their blood lipids and uh, um, IGF-1, uh, which is a marker of aging. But I also want to caution uh, people that IGF-1 is also very good for our skin muscles. So there is a trade-off there. But anyway, IGF-1 went down. So people had beneficial effects, but this was true only for those that for, for which uh, these, uh, ba these values, so triglycerides, IGF-1, were high at baseline, which means, so the, the, the way, uh, which means that probably, uh, you know, why this, this, these values were he, uh, high in baseline? Perhaps the, their diet was uh, also related to that. Perhaps they had a bad diet. It makes sense if they just stop a bad diet for five days, they are going to have good results. Whereas those that have a good diet and stop eating for five days don't see any benefits. I didn't see any uh, analysis of their the habitual diet of, of the people and how that might have the uh, might have affected the 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 result. I didn't see any comparison with other with other interventions. So uh, this is what I teach in my course. And just asking questions. What 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 was tested? Why? How the baseline values may affect what we see? And just asking asking questions. I think helps a lot to uh, put things uh, into context. 
So, so why do you think that is? I mean, what, that's a great example of how difficult nutritional uh, science is to interpret and how apparently hard it is to perform a really good uh, nutritional intervention study. Does it, does it all come down to money? Cause these are expensive trials and there's no big pharmaceutical company to, to sponsor it. Is that the, the main factor there? Or what do you see as, as the sort of hindering aspects of this? So uh, this is a difficult question. I mean, I think uh, that uh, there are many, uh, many reasons. Lack of funding uh, uh, is for sure a problem. Uh, then there is uh, the nature of, uh, of science um, that is more about um, really um, asking the questions than thinking of having the answers. And uh, sometimes it's, it's also normal that we all have our biases that are also going to affect the, the study design. Uh, what I think is important is just to always uh, try uh, to challenge our beliefs and uh, and, uh, um, and make sure that uh, um, we we don't let too much our biases uh, influence also the, the study design. I think this is important. And then science is also a learning process as everything in life. So we then use um uh, what uh, what other studies or previous studies have found to then uh, have new ideas and test new hypotheses uh, uh, so that we can make sure that there is a, a progressive uh, advancement in science in the, in the long term yeah and that's a wonderful point about recognizing our own biases and it applies to scientists too because you can design a trial in a way that favors one outcome over another um, simply by the interventions you do, the, the length of the intervention, what markers you measure. I mean, these are important factors when you design a trial and bias can really creep into there. So as someone who has a personal experience with the keto diet, uh, I imagine this is something you have to fight with yourself too, to make sure you're not trying to just find a study that promotes a keto diet, but actually to, to use legitimate scientific techniques in a most unbiased way possible. Is that something you wrestle with? Oh yes, oh yes, of course, of course I do, um, uh, and uh, uh, especially. Uh, but I, I, I think um, that teaching helps me uh, uh, to really check on my own biases, and I also learn a lot from my students. Um, for example, some of my most engaged students are actually vegans. That, um, for example, for the class on ketogenic diets. Um, uh, by uh, by getting interested in bi the biolo biology of ketogenic diets and uh, uh, framing ketosis as one bio one of the most powerful biological signals of fasting, they actually become open minded. They try a ketogenic diet. They get that a ketogenic diet is not necessarily all about meat and butter. And uh, you can have uh, a pescatarian version of keto, even a plant-based uh, version of keto. And they really thank me for the thought-provoking uh, course, which makes me very happy. Because I think that using uh, an inclusive language is so important for uh, improving uh, science and society in general, even not only in the classroom, but when we on social media or even for, for scientists at, at the conference, I can give you an example. I think most scientists use a lot of uh, scientific jargon when they give a presentation. Um, and uh, this, is, this, is, this is an exclusive language. So th th they, don't, they never get clever, questions from uh, from the audience because they are just not communicating with the audience. I try to use an inclusive language even when I present at conferences and I get the best questions because my message lands where I want it to land and these and I learn a lot from the audience. So if we want all want to learn more and improve science and, and society, uh, we, we, we need to be more uh, uh, inclusive in the way we, uh, we communicate. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I've heard you say 
before you sort of your philosophy on science and scientists and we need to be more like children and be more curious tell tell us a little bit about your your insight there and your philosophy there because i think it's so interesting Yes, I um, I think, uh, you know, I might be um, an idealist, but I think that humans have an inborn love for knowledge and we can use this knowledge to improve our lives. Uh, so we uh, have all been children and we have all loved um, to ask questions to our pa parents. And uh, I think that um, we can uh, awaken our inner child every time we we um, um, read the uh, health the health news uh, or even every time we uh, we we challenge our beliefs we we review our habits and uh, and thoughts and uh, and just asking questions i think um, can uh, can help us uh, improve the way uh, we do nutrition uh, we communicate with people um, and uh, my message i think uh, uh, final closing remark i would like to make is uh, that making questions can uh, help us uh, um, move um, from polarization to personalization nutrition and make uh, love and not war with food. Uh, polarization is what we see um, in, uh, in, in the health news and social media. It's a natural human instinct. Uh, it's our need um, uh, um, of belonging to a tribe, a group of people uh, with similar beliefs uh, that make us feel uh, safe and supported. But I think that pub, uh, polarization is um, is uh, comes to uh, with with a high cost for uh, public health and goes against the the essence of science, which is more about asking questions than thinking of having the answers. And so, I I think that by asking questions we can uh, bring everyone into uh, the conversation uh, and change science and society. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to end it on that note. Very cheerful, optimistic note of what science can be and, and how we can all learn. And with scientists and individuals, we can all learn by asking questions and not being so dogmatic, uh, but actually searching for answers. I think that's wonderful. Now, you, you mentioned a YouTube channel. Um, so many... Uh, tell us what the YouTube channel is and if there's any other places people can find you, because I know after this interview, people are going to be interested in hearing more about you and your perspectives and all your amazing research that you're doing. Yes, I have um, uh, a website where people can find a mailing list to get to receive updates about my projects, publications and courses. Uh, I have um, uh, a Facebook and uh, um, Instagram page uh, at Happy Wellness of my course, uh, online course on uh, diet and gene expression, where I share um, uh, some projects of my students and some knowledge bites uh, about epigenetics. And I have this uh, YouTube channel where I, I, I upload my um, some of my presentations and some videos. I'm not very active on social media, so it's a good idea uh, to subscribe to those channel to get um, to a notification when I, I do uh, have something meaningful to share. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your perspective and your knowledge. Good luck with all the research projects you have going on. And I really look forward to seeing what comes of those. That should be very exciting. And thank you for taking the time to join me. For having me.